Thanks to all of you for coming and to the faculty for inviting me here and my hosts, Darko, Damian, um, Pavel, and Igor, and everybody else who supported my visit to Zagreb. I'm a little bit sad this evening because bef I visited the Museum of Broken Relationships this morning. <laughs> it's a really great place, if, but be prepared to be sad if you go there. I'll try to overcome this sadness and try to spend tonight dispelling um, one of the cherished illusions that all of us hold, which is that you have free will, that you have a choice, and you could have chosen otherwise at every moment of your life. Now, this is an illusion that everybody has, including myself, and I want to try to convince you tonight that it is indeed an illusion that something that we feel is very real in our lives is actually not real. It's a trick that your brain plays on you. And some of you might be offended, that's fine, because I'll be answering questions afterwards and you're free to go after me however you will. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, I'll just give you Samuel Johnson, who lived a long time ago in England, and he was the first person to make an explicit statement in English about free will. Theory is against freedom of the will. And that's the theory I'm going to give you today, but experience is for it. We have the experience in our everyday lives of being able to make free choices. By the way, if anybody has any water, um, I could use a little bit um, during this talk. Okay, so this, the sequence of the talk is going to be as follows. First of all, I'm going to talk about what I mean by free will, because I have to define my terms. This is a philosophy faculty, after all. Second of all, I'm going to give evidence that the belief in free will of the kind I describe is ubiquitous throughout the world. I will talk about the, now the evidence, and this is the meat of the talk, that we don't have that kind of free will, that we're basically robots, computers that are guided by um, hardware and software in our brains. I'll talk about some misconceptions about the idea of determinism, which is behind the idea that we don't have free will because we have to obey the laws of physics and so does our brain. And then I'm going to talk about a group of misguided philosophers called compatibilists who believe that, yes, the laws of physics do apply to everything, including our brain, but there is still a form of free will that we can make up to save the notion that we can make choices. I think that's wrong, and I'll try to explain why it is wrong. And finally, I'm going to tell you why compatibilism is bogus, why it's, an, um, it's just a semantic trick, like theology. And I've already insulted somebody, I'm sure, but you know, as I said, you can get at me at the, at the end of this lecture. Finally, I want to talk about if you are a determinist and you believe that our bodies and brains obey the laws of physics, that does not necessarily mean that you should have a gloomy or pessimistic a view of life, that there are positive implications for realizing that we're just puppets made out of meat. Okay, you may think that there's nothing positive about that, but I'll try to show you what is. So let's begin by defining terms. Thanks. Um, what do I mean by free will? And I've taken the definition from a biochemist, Anthony Cashmore, who wrote a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, which you can write about anything you want if you're elected to the academy. And he chose to write about free will, even though he's a biochemist. When I read this paper, I was under the illusion that I had free will, and within five minutes, I realized that he was right. We don't have free will. His free will he defined, and I will use in this lecture, as the belief that there is something to buy our behavior that is more than the unavoidable consequences of the genetic and environmental history that impinge on our bodies and our brain and the possible stochastic laws of nature, which include quantum indeterminacy. What he's saying is there's something more to our behavior than simply the laws of physics. And free will is the view that that something more is our ability to make free choices that are somehow unconstrained by the laws of physics. Here's an alternative definition, and this is the one that most of us are familiar with. If you could replay the tape of life and go back to any moment where you made a choice, whether it be choose to uh, go to a certain movie or eat something special at dinner or order something off the menu, if you could go back to that moment again with every molecule, electron, and particle in the universe aligned at the same position it was before, Free, you would have free will if you could have decided differently at that moment. In other words, with all the laws of physics and all the molecules in place, nevertheless, 
you could have done something differently from what you did. If you believe that, then you believe in free will. And the purpose of this lecture is to tell you that that doesn't happen. That if you went back to that situation, you would make exactly the same decision that you made before. That we don't have a choice in that sense. And the decision that you make is up to you. Okay, there is some agency that you have in your brain that enables you to choose, and that agency is somehow unrestrained by the laws of physics. Okay, so again, I'll, like a philosopher, although I'm not a philosopher, I'll define terms. There's two ways of viewing the relationship between your body and your brain and the rest of the world as a whole. One of them is called dualism, which is that your will or your agency is independent of the laws of physics. It's sort of like the soul. It's something that floats above your brain. It's not connected materially. It's not subjected to the laws of physics, but it helps you decide. The mind is independent of the brain. and philosophy, that's called dualism. Okay? And dualists are those who believe in free will. They think that, yes, our bodies may obey the laws of physics, but there's something non-substantive or non-substance in your brain that enables you to choose one thing versus another. And then... So that's wrong. Um, most scientists say that there is no dualism, that we are material objects and we obey the laws that apply to all material objects. And then there's the alternative view, which is determinism. And this is what I'm going to try to convince you is the correct scientific view of the world, including ourselves and our behaviors, that our behaviors and choices are completely, 100%, absolutely governed by the laws of physics the deterministic laws of classical mechanics, but also some of the indeterminism, perhaps. Quantum mechanics, where things are truly indeterministic. And even though that some of our behavior may be affected by quantum mechanics, I'll try to show you that that doesn't give us any form of free will whatsoever. Okay, under determinists, because most philosophers and all scientists are determinists, there's two views you can take. The view I take is called incompatibilism, which is that if you believe indeterminism, if you believe that we are physical objects that obey the laws of physics, then free will is not compatible with that view. That is, incompatibilism is the incompatibilism between the I could have done otherwise notion of free will and the laws of physics, okay? And this is the position that I take. Then there's a, the misguided position of some philosophers, that yes, we are guided by the laws of physics. In fact, we're not guided by them. We have to obey them, and so must our behaviors. Nevertheless, there is a form of free will that you can conceive of. This is a semantic trick, as I will maintain, that enables you to say, yes, 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 I do have free will, despite the fact that I am a puppet to the laws of physics. So it's become clear already that I'm an incompatibilist. I'm a determinist, I'm a scientist. I believe that we, just like um, this thing has to obey the laws of physics, and therefore that renders the idea of free will nonsensical, at least the form of free will that I have defined previously. So I hope you've all got a concept. There's other ways of defining free will, and I'll give you some of them, but I want to convince you, and I'll show you with data, that the way most people in the world conceive of is free will is the I could have done otherwise form of free will. Okay. Now, f the view that you have this, I could have chosen otherwise form of free will, is an essential component of most religions and all the Abrahamic religions. They are absolutely rest on the notion of dualistic free will. And they do that in many ways. First of all, you have to have an element of free choice. If you're a Christian, you are said to have the ability to choose to follow Jesus as your savior or not. And if you make the wrong choice, there's where you go. If you make the right choice, you go up. But you have that choice. You could not, ha I mean, it's in your hands whether you choose to accept Christianity or not. This also goes for Islam and Judaism, etc. Second of all, it's a common argument for explaining the existence of moral evil. When you ask a theologian, if God is so good and so caring and so omnipotent, why does he allow murders? Why does he allow people to hurt each other in this planet? And the answer that many theologians give is that God also gave us the very precious gift of free will so we can decide how we behave. And if we choose to behave badly, well, that's just too bad because that's the side effect of God having given us this gift of free will. Why free will is so important to theologians is not clear to me. 
but perhaps somebody can enlighten me on that. But nevertheless, this is a very common argument for why there is moral evil in a world that's constructed by a God who's supposed to be omnipotent and benevolent. And finally, if you have the idea of sin, that is, goes right hand in hand with the idea of free will. For example, the Catholic Church believes that homosexual acts are a grave sin. And what they mean by that is if you commit a homosexual act and you don't confess it, you're going to go to hell. That, now that view presupposes that you could choose whether or not to commit a homosexual act. So the whole view of sin, that whether you're a sinner or not a sinner, is in your hands, is absolutely dependent on this notion of free will. So you can see that free will of the libertarian kind, of the I can do otherwise kind, is an absolutely essential component for many religions and certainly of Christianity and the Catholicism that's so prevalent in Croatia. Um, and the idea that of morality and immorality really does depend on your being able to choose whether to behave right or to behave wrong. And here's just a group, I mean, this is just one religion, which is Islam, which, and they surveyed um, majority Muslim countries throughout the world to ask the percentage of people in there, is homosexuality moral or immoral behavior? And the vast majority of Muslims, ranging from like 65%, I'm not sure Croatia is on this graph, but you're not a majority Muslim country. But you can see that the vast majority of Muslims throughout the world think that homosexuality is immoral. Now, when you say that homosexuality is immoral, that implies that you could have chosen not to be homosexual or not to commit homosexual acts, okay? Unless you're a Calvinist and you think, well, it's all decreed in advance, but that's not what these people believe. It's not what Catholics believe. It's not what Christians believe. Okay, but you can, so the idea of morality is intimately tied up with the idea of free will. And if you don't have free will, then the idea of being morally responsible for your acts becomes nebulous. I'll talk a bit about that shortly. Okay, so let's talk about why most people believe that they do have free will, even though they're wrong. They are given a quiz Okay, and this is the quiz that has been given to many hundreds of people throughout the world. It goes as so. If you imagine a universe, and we'll call it universe A, in which everything that happens is completely caused by what happened before it, i.e., everything obeys the deterministic laws of physics except with some quantum indeterminacy. This has been true from the very beginning of the universe, so what happened at the beginning of the universe causes what happens next, and that causes what happens next, and so on up to the present. So this complete universe of causality with the exception of quantum mechanical phenomena, which as I'll tell you again, has, have nothing to do with free will, even if they do play a role in our behavior. So for example, and this is the example that they give, suppose John was decided to have french fries at lunch. And like everything else, this decision was caused by what happened before him. Maybe he smelled french fries on the way to lunch or something. Um, and if everything in this universe was exactly the same up to when this decision was made, it had to happen that John would decide to have French fries. So this is a universe in which your behavior is absolutely determined by the laws of physics. And if you were to have those, the situation be exactly the same as it was before, you would make exactly the same decision. You'd get the French fries over and over. It's like Groundhog Day, if you've seen the movie. Over and over and over and over again, you get the French fries. Okay, that's one universe. This is described to people who are taking a questionnaire. Then there's a universe with libertarian free will, in which, again, everything is caused by what went before it, with the exception of make human decision-making, which you can decide something otherwise. So that Mary, for example, decides to have French fries at lunch, and for some reason, but if you were to put her in that situation again with every molecule exactly as it was before, her whole experience, her whole genes being identical, it does not have to be the case that Mary would still have french fries again. She could always have a salad. And so there's, she could have a free choice between french fries and a salad. This is kind of a sexist example. It's used over and over again because it's always the woman who has to decide not to eat the french fries and have a salad instead. But I'm just giving this to you because this is the example that people are asked when they're taking this questionnaire. Okay, so people are given these two situations, one in which french fries, french fries, french fries over and over again, french fries, but you could have chosen the salad, even if everything was the same. What kind of universe do we live in? 
the deterministic universe, universe A, or the libertarian universe where decision-making is free, universe B. And this is the result of a survey from four countries in the world, the United States, India, Hong Kong, and Colombia. And you can see that this is the proportion of people answering B, the free will universe, not the deterministic universe. And it ranges from 65% to 85%. Okay, so most people believe that we have the kind of free will in which we could go back and we could have decided otherwise. Some people don't, but a lot of the people that don't aren't determinists, they're just confused. They don't know what to think when they're presented with this example. But this conception of free will is the point I'm trying to make, is ubiquitous, it's worldwide, okay? Now, you ask people, okay, you believe in the free will universe, but what if we lived in the deterministic universe? In that universe where everything is decided by what went before it, are people morally responsible for their actions? If you kill somebody, or if you kick your dog, are you morally responsible for what you do if we live in a scientific universe governed by the laws of physics? And the answer is yes or no. And you can see that most people say no. In the deterministic universe, and again, anywhere between 65 and 75% of the people say no. You're not morally responsible for what you do if you have no ability to choose freely what you do. This is one reason why people object to free will. I mean, sorry, why people object to determinism, because they think, well, if our actions are all determined, then we're not morally responsible for what we do. And my answer to that would be, yeah, you're right. We're not morally responsible for what we do, but we are responsible for what we do. There's a difference between moral responsibility and responsibility. So my view is, and you can disagree with me, that we are responsible for our actions. If I kill somebody, if I kick my dog, if I hit somebody with my car and drive away, or if I drive while I'm drunk, I'm responsible for that. That is, I am the entity who did the thing that society deems to be wrong. But I'm not morally responsible. That is, I could not make a choice about whether to kill somebody or kick my dog or drive drunk. That was determined well before I was born, perhaps by the laws of physics. So this is the way I conceive responsibility from moral responsibility. And what I'll tell you in a minute is, because you're responsible, you still have to be punished. You don't have to have made a choice in order to be punished because there are very good reasons to punish and reward people, even if they are incapable of having chosen differently from how they did. Okay, so why, do I, why am I a determinist? Well, I told you before that if all scientists should be determinists because we accept the laws of physics, but, and, but there's more reasons than that for thinking that our behavior is completely controlled by the movement of molecules in our brain and that we cannot affect the movement of molecules in our brain. First of all, it's first principles. And this absolutely convinced me that we had no free will because our brains are made of matter and matter obeys the laws of physics and whatever happens in our brain has to obey the laws of physics and therefore whatever happens in our brain is the same thing that happens in my computer. It's determined by the program that's in there combined with the external influences that are, could modify that program. So first principles alone convince me that free will is an illusion. But there's more. There are experiments on the timing of volition, and I'll describe one in a minute, showing that the decisions that you make are actually made in your brain before you're conscious of having made them. Now that's a real mind-boggling thing, but this is what neuroscience is beginning to tell us, is that when we think we've made a decision, it's already been made before, and it's been made by whatever physical programs are running in your brain. And finally, there's other experiments that I'll talk about very briefly, studies of Ouija boards where people think that they don't have control, but they do. There's experiments where people think they have control of their actions, but they don't. There's all kinds of physical experiments to do this. What I'm saying is that neuroscience and science in general is showing us that the decisions that we think we made are actually made before we become conscious of having made them. Here's a famous experiment from five years ago, the Soon et al. study, in which people, this is a bit complicated, so I'll walk you through it very quickly, um, as quickly as I can, um, consonant with your comprehension, in which people at a certain point are asked to decide to perform an act. And the act that they're decided to perform, they have two choices. You can either add two numbers or you can subtract them. So it's a simple binary decision. 
And then when you make that decision, you're supposed to record when in your mind, and then you do the addition or subtraction as you have decided. This is all in your head. There's no mechanical motions needed to do this. And then at the end, you record what happens. So here's how it works. You have these screens running before you, one every second. Each screen has four numbers in the corners, and it has a letter in the middle and a number in the middle. And these go by at one second. Now, the people who take this test are trained to do it because it's a bit complicated. You have to learn how to be able to respond properly in this test. So at some point, you're sitting there and you're looking away. And at some point, you decide, OK, I'm going to add or subtract the next two numbers that come by me. And there's no time in which it's specified that you have to choose. It is up to you when you decide whether to add or subtract. This is your conscious decision. So suppose the person decides at that point that he's going to do subtraction. Okay, when, he's, when he or she, um, it could be anybody, they use people of both sexes, the results are the same. And the person remembers what letter was on the screen when they make their decision. So this person says, okay, I'm going to subtract. And he remembers that the Z was on the screen at the moment he made that decision. So then the in the next two slides, he simply subtracts the two numbers in the middle from each other. Six is the first one, two is the second one, so the answer is four. And what happens is on the next screen, there's four numbers. You choose the one that corresponds with the act that you decided up here, which was subtraction. So you six minus four, sorry, six minus two is four. At that point, you press one of the four buttons that corresponds to the four corners. You press the button that labeled four. The next slide tells you you press the button corresponding to the letter that was on the screen when you made your decision, which was Z. So when you do this, the computer automatically records two things. It records when you made the decision, and then it records what the decision was, okay? And because by which button you press, it tells you whether you decided to add or subtract, okay? So here we have a case of an individual supposedly choosing freely, and they do choose at about 50-50 rate, whether to add or subtract. And they also know when the individual says that he or she became conscious of having made that decision. Okay. Then you scan their brains. In fact, this whole experiment is done when you're undergoing functional magnetic resonance imaging, which measures the blood flow to certain parts of your brain, and you can measure how your brain is working in a rather crude way. Um, and you can do this in advance. So for every person, you can associate what brain pattern is associated with subtraction and what brain pattern is associated with addition, because they're different. So for every individual, there's a certain scan that corresponds to the addition decision. There's a certain scan that corresponds to the subtraction decision. This whole experiment is run with somebody being scanned at the same time. And what they find is, and here's the graph of time, that's the moment in which the individual is conscious of having made a decision, time zero. And this is the brain scan showing various patterns of brain activity, for example, in the pre precuneus and the posterior cingulus and the medial frontoplast. And you can see, and I'll just make this assertion, but you can read the paper, Sooner at all 2013, that about six seconds before somebody decides whether to add or subtract, because this is the moment the individual says that they decided to add or subtract, about six seconds before that decision is reaches your consciousness, your brain has already recorded with high likelihood which decision you're going to make. In this case, it's about 60%. But now we've had more refined ways of doing it, and we're up to 80% of correct prediction. So we can predict what decision somebody's going to make. In this case, six seconds, six to 10 seconds before they're able to make it, before they're conscious of having made it. And the more they do these experiments, the more and more of these decisions are pushed back into the past. So what this experiment tells us, and many experiments like it, is that when we're conscious of having made a decision, your brain has already made that decision before your consciousness has comprehended it. To me, this says something very important about free will, which is that you're just confabulating. You think that you're making the decision then, but your brain has already made it for you beforehand. And there's lots of experiments like this um, sometimes they, the accuracy is 80 to 90%. And remember, these are very crude methods of scanning the brain. 
looking at the flow of oxygen in your brain is much is a very crude way of measuring brain activity. If you actually put um, electrodes into your neurons, you can predict with 85% accuracy. And when we were able to actually get into the brain somehow, and maybe your children will be alive to see this, we will probably be able to predict what decision somebody will make with 100% accuracy. Okay, before, they, before they're conscious of having made it, we will be able to tell Mary that she would have had the salad two hours maybe before she made that decision. But of course, these decisions can be modified up to the last moment by various environmental stimuli. The fact is, though, that we do not make the decision. Our brain makes the decision based on its programming, which is a result of evolution and development and our, the environments that we've experienced. I'm not going to go through the rest of the evidence for the fact that we have a, that our sense of agency is an illusion. Just, there's a few of them. If you split somebody's brain, maybe you know about these experiments. Epileptics have had their brains actually cut in half. They split their consciousness so that you almost, it's almost as if you have two brains. Now, it does not, not mean that consciousness has something to do with brain structure. And in fact, you can affect people's decisions by this. Um, alien hand syndrome, they're a group of people that have this disease in which they look at this, and, that's not my hand, it's somebody else's hand. Somebody else is moving it. So they're moving it themselves, but they don't have the feeling of agency that, they, that everybody else does. And it's because there's a lesion in their brain. You can screw up people's brains in such a way that eliminates their sense of agency. Does that not mean that your sense of agency and of choice and of free will is dependent on the physical structure of your brain? Um, there's patients that feel like they have no self. This is called Cotard syndrome, and it's a very sad disease, even sadder than the Museum of Broken Relationships. There's pain asymbolia. There's people who cannot feel pain. They do not have the subjective conscious sensation of pain. Now, this is just about consciousness, not necessarily about choice, because of brain lesions. You can make yourself unconscious by just simply inhaling gas, and you can bring yourself back to consciousness by by taking away the anesthetics. Everybody that's had surgery knows this. You can produce intentions. You can produce people's desire to do something or feeling that they need to do something or will do something simply by stimulating regions of the brain. So you can stimulate a region of the brain and it will make somebody want to lick their lips really bad. They don't necessarily do that, but it makes them feel like they have to do that. Um, and you can change somebody's personality by using magnetic stimulation of the brain. There's a famous experiment where a patient was being operated on in the brain and they stuck an electrode in the brain and they pressed the buzzer and the patient went like this. And the doctor said, well, why did you just wave? And the patient said, oh, because I was just saying hi to the nurse that was walking by. But in, I mean, that's a confabulation. That is a post facto rationalization of something that happened through brain stimulation. And this I maintain is how our feeling of agency works. It's a post facto confabulation or rationalization of the electrical activity in our brain that has already decided what to do. All of you are familiar with having done very complicated tasks without being aware of having made a decision. Every time I drive home from the grocery store, I'm on autopilot. I don't say, okay, I'm gonna turn right now, I'm gonna turn left now. This is all encoded in my brain in a way that I'm not conscious of. Okay, so that's determinism. It's kind of, maybe some of you are kind of depressed now, or maybe you're just waiting to tear me apart at the end of this lecture. But before you do that, I just want to say some misconceptions about determinism. That is, um, a lot of people think that the view, the scientific view of brain activity has some implications which are not very savory. This first one is very common. If everything I do is determined by the laws of physics and my brain and my environment and my heredity, why bother to get out of bed in the morning? Shouldn't I just be completely apathetic or nihilistic because after all, everything's already been determined? And this is a very common view. I mean, Ed E.O. Wilson, the famous biologist, has said this, without the belief in free will, the mind imprisoned by fatalism will slow and deteriorate, okay? Now, this isn't true because I'm a determinist and a lot of people are determinists and I get out of bed every morning. I got out of bed to come here and give you this talk. The fact is that our sense of agency is so strong that we will go on doing what we're going to do 
even if on a gut level or an intellectual level, we realize that our decisions are conditioned by the laws of physics. So this is a false warning. I mean, I think the whole world could become deterministic and it wouldn't change one bit in terms of our behavior, but it will change things like our judicial system. The belief in determinism makes you cheat or act badly. There was a famous experiment where students were given two passages, one by Francis Crick on determinism, another one by another scientist on free will, and then they were asked to do a computer th program that would detect their ability to cheat. And they found that the people who read the deterministic passage by Crick cheated more often. From this one experiment done on one population of students in the American South, people concluded that if you believe in determinism, you're going to cheat and act badly. Remember, they did this test within an hour and assumed that these results were going to carry over for the rest of the person's life. Um, this is the view of Dan Dennett, for example. I won't, he said that the doctrine that free will is an illusion is likely to have profoundly unfortunate social consequences if not rebutted forcefully. Here we see the beginning of the philosophical opposition to free will, which is not based on science. It's based on the view that if you don't believe in free will, you're going to do bad stuff. Okay. Well, it turns out if you read the paper in Science a couple months ago about the lack of replicability of psychological experiments, the experiment that led to this conclusion is one of those. In fact, there is no consistent evidence, even for that kind of experiment, that if you read a passage on determinism, it's going to turn you into a criminal or a cheater. I believe in determinism, but I defy anybody to find a difference in my behavior before or after I became converted. Belief in determinism um, absolves us of responsibility. Again, Dan Dennett, who's a prime compatibilist, thinks that if we are determinist, we are not responsible for what we do. Here's a statement that he's made for that. If nobody is responsible, then no contract is valid. You shouldn't have mortgages. We cannot hold anybody to account for anything they do. In other words, if you're determinist, empty the jails because those people had no ability to no control over what they did, what's the point of putting them in prison? This is a profound error, and I'll try to show you why, because there are very good reasons, even if you're a determinist, to reward people and to punish them, even if you think they had no choice about what they did. Determinism means that everything is predictable, but it doesn't seem that way. Well, yeah, determinism sort of means that everything is predictable. Whoops, sorry, I'm standing in front of the screen. Um, but we don't have the ability as humans to do make those kinds of predictions because we don't understand how the brain works very well. And moreover, there may be a quantum indeterminacy in our decisions where there's some fundamentally un indeterminate things that happen in our brain that will make us choose otherwise. So it is possible that if an electron jumps in a certain way, at a certain moment, that if you went back in time, you would actually make a different decision than you did. So the notion that it is, you could have done otherwise free will is slightly wrong. I should say physics-free free will, okay? But the fact that an electron jumps and changes your decision doesn't mean that you made that electron jump. Remember, it has to be your responsibility for your choice to make a choice one way or the other. So yeah, we can't predict what we're going to do, and it's a good thing, too, <laughs> that we can't. But you can be a determinist and also except the fact that the brain is so complicated, human behavior is so uncomplicated, I mean, it's so complicated that we will never be able to predict what we're going to do. Although some Christians or religious people think God knows what we're going to do. Okay, determinism doesn't take into account quantum mechanical phenomena in the brain, which are fundamentally indeterministic. That is true. If it is the case that in our brain, some fundamental quantum indeterminacy operates, then maybe if you went back to a given point in time, you could have done something differently. And there's two problems with that. First of all, we don't know if our brains work on a quantum level like that. And a lot of neuroscientists say no. It's a, the, brain, the neurons are too large to be affected by quantum phenomena. But even if they were, so what? So an electron jumps and you have the salad and the set of french fries. That doesn't mean you made the choice to have the salad before french fries. It means that electron made the choice and you had no control over that electron. So evoking quantum indeterminacy to save free will is a bad move. Okay, and finally the last 
misconception, and this is probably the most common misconception about interpretism, is that it's useless to change people's minds because after all, what they've decided to do is determined. But that's a misconception as well. And I, you can do it very simply. If your dog comes up, if you have a dog, and to be petted, and instead of petting it, you kick the dog, very quickly that dog's behavior is gonna be changed. He's gonna shy away from you. In fact, you can change people's behavior, even under determinism, by environmental stimuli that reprogram the computer program in the brain. So yes, you can modify behaviors, even under determinism, by changing the wiring of people's brains. So determinism does not mean that it's useless to change your mind. In fact, what I'm doing now, standing here before you, is trying to change your mind about whether you have free will or not. Now, I was determined to do that, maybe months ago, <laughs> It's an endless regress of what happens, and it gets very mind-boggling. But nevertheless, I could possibly change a few minds here today. Um, this is one of my readers on my blog who made this argument. How can punishment be a deterrent if people would have carried out their actions anyway? It is fallacious to suggest that putting somebody in prison is going to deter other people from that. This is just muddled thinking. Okay, you can rewire brains just like you can rewire computers by just going in there and tinkering with them. Okay, despite that, and there are a lot of people that intuitively realize that the logical scientific materialistic position is that we are determined by the laws of physics. People will nevertheless say, well, okay, maybe that's true but let's not tell everybody that <laughs> because they're all gonna become criminals or they're all gonna lie in bed in the morning and not do anything. And this is Paul Davies, who's a religious physicist. He says, even if they are right and free will is an illusion, it may be a fiction worth maintaining, okay? Now this is, this is what I call the little people argument. I know the truth, but the little people out there in society, um, they shouldn't know the truth because it's harmful to them. Am I, I, can you still hear me? This microphone's a little strange. Okay, so that's, in that way it's like theology. And I'm gonna show you there's a real number of parallels between belief in free will and theological beliefs in God. It's not an accidental parallel. Okay, so what about, um, can we still have free will even though we can't, okay? And there are a number of philosophers, Dan Dennett being the most prominent one about among them who are determinists because 90 to 100% of philosophers are determinists, but 70% of them still say we have free will. Now how can that be? Well, it's because they have this thing called compatibilism. Even though our behaviors are absolutely determined by the laws of physics and we could not have chosen otherwise from what we did, we still have a form of free will, okay? It's okay, we still have free will. But how can that be? Well, the compatibilists, they pull a number of tricks. Form number one, or trick number one, you have free will if you don't make your decision under completely coercive circumstances. For example, if a criminal goes up to you and holds a gun to your head and says, give me your wallet, you're gonna give him your wallet if you're rational. <laughs> and that's coercive, right? So this is supposedly, if you make a decision and you're not coerced, like somebody holding a gun to your head, then that is considered free will, even if it obeys the laws of physics. Sam Harris, who wrote a good book called Free Will about this, points out that there's no difference between someone holding a gun to your head and your neurons telling you what to do in your brain. There is nothing more, co more coercive about giving money at gunpoint than there is about drinking milk when you're thirsty. That is, every decision you make is a coerced decision. It's coerced by the laws of physics, and the computer program that is your brain. So this does not really give us any kind of free will at all. It just makes a distinction between who's doing the coercing and who's not, but it's all coerced. Second of all, this is Dan Dennett's main solution to compatibilism. We have complicated brains compared to like a worm or a crow. We have to take in a lot of information before we make a decision, like which class to take or what we're gonna have for dinner. And so there's a lot of complicated inputs before we spit out the output that is called a decision. And this then says, it constitutes a form of free will. Well, it's not, because even though the inputs are multifarious and numerous, we still don't have any choice freely about what we do. The outcome of all these inputs is 
determined in advance, no matter how many inputs there are. And here's one example. This is, the, I think this is deep blue, the chess playing computer. It takes in a lot of information before it makes a move. Does this computer have free will? Because it does, according to Dan Dennett's definition, it has, takes in a lot of possible information about moves, things like that. And I would say, no, it doesn't have free will. That just because your pro computer program is more sophisticated than somebody else's doesn't mean that you have more free will than you do because you're both equally coerced by the laws of physics. Number three, free will is the view that if circumstances had been slightly different, that is maybe Mary didn't want any salad that night because she saw somebody eating a bad tomato, that you could have made a different decision, okay? Well, this is not compatibilism. This is not even relevant to the question. All it means is if things are different, your decision could have been different. It doesn't give you free will. It doesn't attack the fundamental problem that decisions are based on inputs and outputs from laws of physics. And finally, this is another form of compatibilism. You can see there are many forms of compatibilism, and they're actually incompatible with each other. Free will represents the decisions that people make when they are not mentally ill. It is what well-behaved people do. So if I'm a rational person and I decide to do something, regardless of whether that decision was determined, that is free will. Whereas somebody who's insane, like Donald Trump, for example, if, if they make a decision, well, that's not a decision made of their own free will because their brains aren't working properly. Okay. Well, you can probably think of the answer to this one. In both cases, the decisions are coerced. You don't have a choice whether you're a well-behaved person or not, or whether you conform to society's expectations and mores. That's not your choice. That's determined by the laws of physics, too. So this does not save in any meaningful way the notion of free will. Okay. So I've given you four forms in which philosophers have tried to save the notion of free will, and there's profound problems with every single one of them. My conclusion is that the debate between compatibilism and incompatibilism is a purely semantic debate. What compatibilists do is they take the word free will and they change its meaning in order to say, yes, you have free will. But they're using a notion of free will that's different from the one that most people in the world accept. Because everybody thinks of free will, or almost everybody, as the I could have done otherwise form of free will. Moreover, the definitions of free will are incompatible with each other. I mean, I just gave you four different ways in which free will is defined to give us the ability to have it, but they're incompatible. So which one is right? Are they all right? They can't all be right, and one of them has to be right if all of them are right. And none of them attack the main problem of free will, which is the one that Sam Harris outlined in his book. Compatibilism ignores the very source of our belief in free will the feeling of conscious agency. People feel that we're the authors of our thoughts and actions. We feel like we make decisions, and that is the only reason why there is a problem of free will worth talking about. Because we feel so deep in our brains, or our souls, to use a metaphor, that we are making a choice, and we could have chosen otherwise. That's the problem that science is attacking. Is this true or not? Could we have chosen otherwise? And what I've tried to convince you is that science says no. Okay. Sam Harris defines compatibilism in this way. It's kind of snarky, but it's true. Compatibilism says a puppet is free as long as he loves his strings. Okay. The strings, of course, are the compatibilistic definitions of free will, which do not give us agency. They just make us think we have it. Okay. So why do people, why are philosophers so busy with compatibilism? I mean, it seems to me it's a much more important problem to accept and embrace determinism of behavior than to worry about semantics. So why are philosophers like Dennett so concerned with the semantic issues rather than with the real substantive issues? Well, Dan said it explicitly, we don't want people disabling themselves with bad science. And this is a very serious issue. It's the same thing that the um, scientists said before. If people didn't think they had free will, society would fall apart. This reminds me of a statement which was supposedly made by the wife of the Bishop of Worcester when the, her husband, the bishop, said, you know, this guy Darwin has come up with this idea of evolution, and it looks pretty good. And the bishop's wife said, my dear, we're descended from the apes? Let us hope it is not true. But if it is true, let us pray that it will not become generally known. 
This is the kind of view that Dan Dennett is espousing here. Yeah, we're determined in our behavior, but, but let's not tell people that. Because if we tell them that, they're going to start running wild in the streets. Contracts will be invalid, mortgages will be invalid, et cetera, et cetera. The literal people argument. Free will is, determinism is too sophisticated, too much a, a blow in the solar plexus of our psyche to be promulgated to the average person. Okay. Now, I said before that, that compatibilism resembles sophisticated theology, and what I mean by sophisticated theology is the kind of theology that, say, the bishop, is there, there is a bishop of Zagreb, presumably, right? The kind that the bishop of Zagreb would promulgate. There's a number of parallels between this kind of sophisticated theology, and I've had some of these people in my lectures the last two days, and belief in free will. First of all, they redefine old notions. Sophisticated theologians redefine God. He's no longer a guy with a beard in the sky that sends you to heaven or hell. He is a ground of being, or he is love, or he is everywhere. All these sophisticated concepts of what God is, all designed to get around the fact that we haven't seen any evidence for God. Well, this is what compatibilists do the same thing. They redefine free will from you could have done otherwise free will into, well, we're complicated beings and we take in a lot of information and that gives us free will. That's a redefinition of the term that everybody thinks. Um, definitions are confected post facto. After we, science tells us that we don't really have free will, then the theologians have to go back and the neuroscientists, sorry, the, the philosophers have to go back and redefine the old terms. And for theologians, after God was sh shown to be not very visible, they redefined God Philosophers redefine free will in the same way. Um, in both cases, people think it's wrong or it's dangerous to know the truth about the world. So even though a lot of theologians are sort of atheists, maybe even blatant atheists, if you've read Dan Dennett's Clergy Project, you'll know there's a lot of people who are preaching who don't believe in God at all. Um, but they, they keep telling people that there is a God because they think it's dangerous to not believe in God. In the same way, compatibilists think it's dangerous not to believe in free will. Both human, both groups of people set aside humans as special. They're human exceptionalists. Both theologians and compatibilists think that we need, have to have a notion of either God or free will in order to give us a sense of moral responsibility. I don't think we need either of those to have a sense of responsibility. There are as many versions of compatibilism as there is of God. If you ask a sophisticated theologian from who's a Jew, one thing, or a Catholic, another, they'll give you different notions of what God is, both of them incomprehensible. And finally, and this is fundamentally the main point, both scientists and theologians dismiss scientific critiques of their views um, as being misguided, that theology and free will are the purview of philosophers and not scientists and say this is our area you scientists stay out of it despite the fact that I've told you um, repeatedly that the attacks on free will and the support for determinism has come from science not from philosophy okay but the philosophers they want to say that this is their area and we should stay out of it we should stop doing brain scanning experiments you know it, it could hurt the little people because they might realize that their decisions are made before they're conscious of that. Okay, so I'm gonna wind up with talking about why determinism is good. What are the good parts of being deterministic rather than believing in free will or believing in compatibilism? First of all, determinism is true, okay? And I happen to believe that you should not hide what is true from the public, no matter what the social consequences could be. Because you have to, if you hide things from the public, they're gonna eventually gonna learn it anyway and they're not gonna trust you. And we have to make social policy based on the truth, not based on some fiction designed to keep everybody happy. Second of all, if you are religious, and I happen to be anti-religious, if I'm a religious but I'm also anti-religious, the lack of free will dispels all the parts of religion that are dependent on free will. The notion that you have a freedom to choose your savior, the notion that being gay is a choice that you make and it's the wrong choice, um, that, that we have free will because, um, sorry, we have evil because God gave us free will. So believing in determinism helps us dispel much of religious philosophy and I think that's a good thing. 
but I talked about that two days ago. And finally, and this is the most important thing that I'm concerned with, determinism has serious consequences for our criminal justice system. How we re punish people, also how we re reward people, but that's a less serious problem, as well as for our notions about moral responsibility, politics, and personal behavior. Okay, so when I first realized I was a determinist, I thought about it quite hard, and I thought, well, how should my, my personal behavior and philosophy change now that I've become a determinist? And the first thing that happened was that you lose your sense of regret for things that happen bad to you. And that happened to me one day when I was thinking about an old girlfriend that I was engaged to and things didn't work out. And I kept thinking, Jesus, if only I had done this, if only I had done that. If you go to the Museum of Broken Relationships, you'll see this all over the place. I should have done this, I should have done that, and then it would have worked out. But you could not have done otherwise. So once you realize that, you should give up your sense of regret. You should stop flagellating and recriminating yourself for things that you had no control over. And instantly, you should lose the ability to stop being yourself. Now, you can ruminate about things that went wrong in order to prevent them from going wrong in the future. You can learn from them, but you should not spend any time regretting what happened in the past because that was something that was absolutely unavoidable. So you don't beat yourself up. It reduces your egotism because now you realize that every human being in this room is guided by the laws of physics. That entails um, an empathy towards your fellow human beings, which you might not have otherwise. Instead of saying, oh, that guy's an idiot, he's always doing the wrong thing, you gotta realize this human being is a broken individual and his environment or her environment and her genes make them behave this way and they have no control over it. And I think that ineluctably breeds a form of empathy towards your fellow humans that you would not get if you thought they were actually making choices about how they behave, and you have a feeling of empathy and unanimity with other human beings. And I think this is one of the good parts of determinism. The most important thing is crime and punishment. The law already takes into account the lack of free will of people. If you were thought to have committed a crime and you, didn't, you had no choice about having committed that crime, then you were treated differently, at least in the American legal system, than you would have been if you, they thought you did it by free will. The whole justice system is based on whether or not you did something wrong and could have done something differently. So we have, for example, the insanity defense. If you were thought to have been insane when you committed a crime and you couldn't have done anything else, then you're found not guilty by reason of insanity. You're still punished in a way. You're put in a hospital, but you're treated much differently from somebody who is judged sane, who is thrown in a horrible prison in the United States. Um, there's lots of ways that this defense is used. It's not always successful. Insanity is a good defense if the person really is insane, but there's lots of other sort of deterministic defenses. There's the so-called Twinkie defense, where a criminal who killed somebody would say, well, he ate a lot. Do you have Twinkies in Croatia? It's, a, it's like a cake filled with styrofoam, <laughs> with plastic. It's not very good, but this, the criminal was judged, was, his defense lawyer said he ate too much sugar and he had no control over his behavior. And that was considered as a form of deterministic behavior that could be exculpatory. It didn't work. It usually doesn't work. There's affluenza defense. I was too rich to understand that what I was doing was wrong because I don't know how the rest of the world behaves. That was used in a case of rape didn't work, but the law, the important thing is to realize is that the law already recognizes a difference in responsibility from um, if you had a choice or not. Okay. So, I've told you that people are responsible for their actions, but they're not morally responsible, but I've also told you that we still need to punish people for things that they do wrong. And there's three reasons why we should do that. First of all, you have to keep them out of society if they do something wrong. If somebody's a sociopath or a habitual criminal or murderer, you can't just let them run free. You have to keep them out of society. These are things that are good for society as a whole and for the individual who commits a crime. You, have, you, you put them you can, in jail to rehabilitate them. If somebody's a criminal, if you can make them stop their criminal behavior by some kind of psychological intervention, then you should do it because nobody should have to be in jail if they're reformed. You should let them go back out into society, enjoy their freedom and make contributions, and you should punish people to deter others. That is, if you see somebody do something wrong and you see that they get 
go to jail for it, that keeps you from doing something wrong. So these forms of punishment are all compatible, I hate to use the word compatible, but they're, they're all compatible with deterministic view of behavior. These are things that we can do to people that will have salutary, salubrious effects on society and on the person themselves. What you don't want to do is punish them retributively, which is what we do in America. We punish people because we think they made the wrong choice. They could have not pulled the trigger. They could have not raped somebody. They could have chosen not to steal the jewels. But they made the wrong choice, and they're going to be punished for it. The death penalty is the ultimate form of retributive punishment. If you kill somebody, you die. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There is no justification for retributive punishment under a deterministic view, because you had no choice in what you did. And so nothing is affected, either for society or you're the person guilty by killing them. It's not even a deterrent to, be, to have the death penalty. So you can't even use that excuse to kill somebody. I'm sure that Croatia does not have the death penalty because very few civilized countries do. Japan does, the United States does, Singapore does, but most people at least have the degree of enlightenment to realize that nothing good comes from killing people as an action of the state. And finally, there's the just world belief which is the belief that Republicans have in our country, poor people are poor because they chose to be poor. That the lower classes are that way. We shouldn't have to help them because they made the choice to do bad. They made the choice to have single parent families. They made the choice to sell drugs. They made the choice to drop out of school. And so therefore they deserve what they get. But nobody makes those choices. Those, what you do is a absolutely determined by your genes and environment, and therefore you should not say people deserve to be poor when they didn't make that choice to be poor, okay? So this, again, is the form of empathy that comes from believing in free will. Okay, I'm almost through now, I think three minutes left. Crime and punishment is the most important thing that determinism views. Here's an American that was executed uh, in 2015, this is uh, Cecil Clayton. He was worked in a sawmill cutting lumber. He had an accident. That's what happened to his brain. He lost one quarter of the front of his brain. His personality changed immediately. He became aggressive. He became sociopathic. This was not a result of a choice he made. This was a result of an accident he had. But he killed somebody because he behaved badly. What did they do to this person? Well, you would say, put him in a hospital, or try to somehow fix whatever problem was engendered by that. What they did was to kill him. They executed him. Why did they execute him? Because, they, because Cecil Williams said, I understand why you're killing me. That was enough for the people of the state of Missouri to decide to give him a lethal injection. I understand why you're executing me. I violated the rules of society, therefore I am being killed. That is not a good reason to execute somebody, okay? How do we fix the system of punishment? Well, I've already told you, we punish for deterrence, rehabilitation, or sequestration. Here's an example of what I consider an enlightened prison system, although it's not explicitly modeled on um, determinism. It might, may as well have been, and this is the Norwegian prison system. How many of you know this guy there? Uh, yeah, in Europe, no American knows him because we're such a parochial country. But that's Anders Breivik, who is the Norwegian who killed, I think it's 71 people. Um, he, yeah, he killed 77 people in 2011. He went wild with a gun on an island where a number of children were having a camp. That's a horrible thing to do. He just went around shooting everybody. That's the worst thing you can do is to take so many lives, especially the lives of young children, and taking away their future. What happened to Anders Breivik? In this prison system of Norway, he was sentenced to 21 years in prison. The maximum sentence that can be given under Norwegian law. Now what happens is, after 21 years, he's psychologically evaluated to see if he's rehabilitated. If he is, they let him go. He's probably not gonna be, <laughs> because as you can see, he's still, he's still right wing. But at least they don't put him in prison for life because at least there is some possibility for rehabilitation. And there's this prison cell in Norway. It has a computer, it has a treadmill, it has a microwave, it has a DVD player. He can cook his own meals, he gets newspapers, he gets magazines. He's still sequestered. He can't do anybody any harm, but at least he has a decent, dignified existence, okay? Now you might say, well, this is coddling the criminal. 
if we treated criminals like this, everybody would commit crimes to get a nice cell like that, or at least there would be no deterrence. But the fact is, if you look at Norway, the recidivism rate, which is the number of convicted criminals that go back to jail again after they've already been in jail once, is 20%. And the incarceration rate is seven hundredths of 1%. Okay. In other words, seven people in 10,000 are imprisoned in Norway. Now, how about the United States, where the punishment is very different? You're not going to see a cell like this anywhere in America. I'll show you what one looks like in a minute. The recidivism rate is 77% based on our own free will based system of punishment, 77% of people who go to jail go back to jail again for committing another crime. And the crime rate is, points, is 10 times higher than it is in Norway. Now I'm not saying that this is completely responsible for the difference in crime rates, because after all in America we have lots of guns and horrible things like that that help people commit crimes. But this recidivism rate, which is almost a quarter of what it is in the United States, speaks to me of this is the way we should be treating criminals, like broken individuals that need to be taken out of society but given a chance to re be rehabilitated and put back in society and not punished as if they made the wrong choice. Now in India, it's different. There's a prison cell in India. You can imagine how horrible it is to be in prison there. Here's a prison cell in America and a maximum security prison. In this prison, there put in this cell for 23 hours a day, they're allowed one hour of solitary exercise. It's just a horrible way, and it's all based on the notion that you have to punish somebody because they made the wrong choice. Okay, so I'm gonna end by just making a few modest proposals, how things should be changed. I've already told you one way things should be changed. We need to go into the criminal justice system and stop treating criminals as if they made the wrong choice. Okay, first of all, in terms of our notion of free will, we should stop saying we have free will. We should say instead, my decision was caused by internal factors that I did not understand, which happens to be the truth. Second of all, get rid of the notion of moral responsibility. I don't think it makes any sense to hold people morally responsible. You hold them responsible, but adding the word moral implies that they could have done something else. Okay, so here's the really interesting questions that need to be answered. What are the effects of deterministic view on punishment and reward? How can we best punish prisoners so that society and the prisoner themselves are improved? And this is an empirical question, which is sociological and scientific in basis, but there are other questions. Philosophical questions, does moral responsibility mean anything more than responsibility? What does the word moral mean when you tack it onto the word responsibility? More scientific questions, how far ahead can we predict decisions before they're made consciously? That's a scientific question. And finally, what are the genetic environmental factors that affect the choices we make? That's another scientific question. So you can see three out of these four interesting questions are not philosophical in nature, they're scientific. And I'll just end with one more thing, which is, well, if we don't have free will, if we're subject to the laws of physics, why do we believe so deeply in our brains and our guts and our metaphorical souls that we do make decisions? And I don't know is the answer to that. I mean, it might have been an evolved phenomenon. And I can think of several reasons why evolution would make us feel as if we had the ability to choose otherwise. I'm not gonna go through all these because I'm out of time, but this is the one I tend to grab on. If you think that you are able to make choices, you might try harder to do things, okay? Whereas if you think that you, if you're a determinist, then you might not try so hard, maybe. And maybe that's why natural selection instilled in us the feeling that we could make choices. Or it could be an epiphenomenon. It doesn't have to be a result of natural selection. So I'll finish now with two quotes from famous people, because when a famous person, especially a scientist, says something, everybody says, yeah, that's right, because this person is so damn smart that they must be right. Well, here's two smart people talking about free will. Charles Darwin, who was a determinist, one doubts the existence of free will because every action determined by heredity, constitution, examples of teaching or other, this view of determinism should teach one profound humility. One deserves no credit for anything, nor ought, one, ought, nor ought one to blame others. Okay, Darwin was a determinist. And of course, the smartest man in the world, Albert Einstein, 
who is also a determinist, and he made this very cute quote, if the moon in the act of completing its way around the earth were gifted with a consciousness, it would be convinced that it was traveling around the earth of its own accord. And so would a being endowed with higher insight and more perfect intelligence, i.e. us, watching man, oh sorry, he's talking about a God, but he didn't believe in God. He's just saying if somebody was watching human beings and understood their behavior, that being would smile about man's illusion that he was acting according to his own free will. Thank you. Well, I can't. I mean, I tried to qualify that, but maybe I didn't do a very good job of it. In fact, if the universe started over again, things probably wouldn't develop exactly the same way. I mean, I talk about this in my book, which is on sale outside, uh, Fact versus Fact. If evolution started over again, would we get exactly the same result? My answer is probably not, because at least part of evolution, the mutational process, is one that may well depend on quantum mechanics. So, so the world is, what I, instead of using the word, the word determinism, I should have said, according to the laws of physics. And I tried to put that in the talk, which includes both classical determinism and quantum mechanics. Now be aware that there's a school of physicists who think that quantum mechanics is deterministic. We just don't understand how yet. And, but Bell's inequalities would seem to put that to rest. So what I mean is that the universe is governed by the laws of physics and so are our brains and our behaviors. And that still does not give us any room for conscious agency or for having to decide otherwise. Just can I expand so you would agree that we never know what we're going to get? We never know what? What we're going to get. Because we well, sometimes we do. I mean, if, the, if we never knew we were going to get, playing pool would never work, right? <laughs> no, no, it's a logical conclusion because if you claim that there is a truly random process, you never can know what you... No, 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 no. I mean, his, his, you have a good point, which is if there is a true random process in the universe, and there is one, as far as we know, quantum mechanics, truly indeterministic. Maybe not, but physicists say, say yes. We still, classical mechanics applies on the macro level. So Sean Carroll, for example, the physicist, has a chapter in his new book, um, I think it's called The Big Picture, about how everything on the macro level that we deal with as human beings is obeys the laws of physics in a deterministic way. So in general, yeah, I, I mean, every time you drive your car, every time you use your cell phone, every time you play pool, you are counting on certain laws of physics applying. When you get up an airplane, you expect the, you don't think, Jesus, this plane's gonna crash because of quantum mechanics. I mean, on most macro phenomena, we don't need to think about quantum mechanics. And it may well be the case that even with our brains, we don't have to, consider quantum mechanics because it's such a small scale phenomenon that it may play no role whatsoever in the determinism of our behavior. But I would say, you know, if evolution started again or if the universe started again, things would not be exactly the same as they are now. Okay. Can I just put my comment is similar to this? Yeah, uh, we have, um, do we have, hold on a second. Uh, the, one of the important evolutionary phenomena, genetic which is sorry. Uh, genetic drift which is completely stochastic and i don't believe that if we if we have a chance to repeat this uh, old earth experiment that outcome would be the same well genetic drift is the random changes in gene frequencies due to unpredictable factors like meiosis but genetic drift i would not say is a quantum mechanical indeterministic phenomenon the reason genetic drift we can't predict it is because we can't predict it but it is still deterministic that is which which allele, big A or little a, gets put in a sperm or an egg is still a deterministic phenomenon, but we do not know how to predict that. We don't, know not, we don't have enough knowledge to predict that. So it looks as if it is a random phenomenon, but it's not truly a random phenomenon. It just behaves as if it were random, but in, on the macro, micro scale, it's a deterministic phenomenon that we just don't understand. <laughs> so uh, in a deterministic universe, uh, it's covered by a full set of physical laws, right? Yes. Okay, so this set of laws, uh, it determines uh, 
like everything multi people do, like everything that has happened throughout the history has been determined by the that one set is closed. Large, yes. Okay, so that means that every sentence that has ever been pronounced, every callback has been closed, is determined by that set of laws. And so, uh, and this set of laws, it's not like it, it took it in a very year, because uh, it has to be uh, a certain set of laws that allows for a period of life of uh, beast, such as I just yeah. asked. So that means that the one set of laws, uh, uh, produces uh, is uh, able to bring about the existence of human beings and also this uh, exact set of our thoughts and sentences that have been pronounced uh, in the set and thought throughout the history. So, so you have said Yeah, I'm just waiting for your question. Okay. So, uh, like, what's the meaning of that? Like, if this is the only set of laws that allows for existence of life and uh, the intelligence and not like to add talk and everything, so, like, uh, what's their uh, meaning? It's like, what's a, like, uh, the physical constant beings uh, has some value, and it, it has a value, produces, uh, and uh, makes uh, beings, uh, information values, makes Kant's writings, uh, I don't know. So, like, what's I'm going to your question. Yeah. You have to, uh, let me ask. That should be briefer than your questions okay. because there's a lot of people who say so, so when is it? What's the connection between that uh, values of the physical virus and the uh, and the physical laws that obtain in this universe and uh, this uh, this uh, history that has happened and uh, especially with the human uh, uh, Okay. Um, I think I got your question. So what he's, I think what you're elaborating is the fine-tuning argument. I'm not sure whether you're using it to give existence for God or not. It doesn't matter. But we do have a set of physical laws that has made the existence of life possible on this planet. Okay. Now theologians say that shows that God made these physical laws. And other people like Sean Carroll say, well, it could be an accident that we have these laws and we're just the result of those laws and we're here to be able to say, well, God must have done it. There's other people that say there's many universes that have many different physical laws. Okay, how does this bear on the question of determinism? It doesn't matter. All that's required for determinism is that there is a set of physical laws that is not violated. It doesn't matter whether, you know, the Newton's constant is 9.8 or 10.2 or whatever. All that matters is that the laws of physics apply in a universe and they are not violated. If that's the case, then matter obeys the laws of physics. And as far as we know, in our universe, the laws of physics apply everywhere because we can use them to predict what's going to happen at, the, at remote distances, how we can put probes on comets and things like that. So... You know, the, the existence of whatever set of physical laws there is um, doesn't matter as long as it's a constant set of physical laws that applies uniformly throughout a universe like ours. I do agree that the universe is not deterministic. Sorry? Are the universe deterministic or not? Uh, no, it's not. I mean, I use the word determinism in a sort of loose way, and I tried to qualify it. Um, it's indeterministic in that quantum mechanics, there's certain things that only quantum mechanics can explain. Like if you have a lump of uranium, which atom is going to detect next? That's not determined by any laws of physics. It's a random phenomenon. Some completely stochastic quantum quantum Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 But we as uh, persons are, in our decisions, are in interaction with the universe, with the environment. Yes. And it is non-linear process. The uh, measure of idea is caused by the interaction of our senses, our experience. So we have five senses. Yes. So this is not the linear process and you know for deterministic errors. But in my opinion. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's deterministic. For you. Made some decision precisely, you will have to know enormously precise the starting conditions. And even if the universe is not completely, uh, you can uh, concept the principles, which is fundamental law of physics. So the universe is not completely.
really uh, uh, precise. There is certain uncertainty. Yeah. And if you want to know some non-linear physical process perfectly in what direction you, you will have to know precisely the yeah. starting point. Even yeah, if, right. my, if my uh, idea I form when I talk with you now is determined by my act in one year from now, certainly one million and three million staviti vrlo kratko, kako ljudi čeka odgovor ono dvije rečenice pitanja koje profesor može odgovoriti raspravu, sad ne možemo imati posljedno zato što vas nikoli ne čuje što pričati, to sam ovim ljudi koji vas direktno obraćati. Vrlo kratko, dvije rečenice pitanja, ako je moguće. Ok, so do you see my act in one year from now is determined? That what is? My, what I will do in one year from now? Largely. Yes, I, I think that's largely true. Insofar as quantum phenomena may affect what you do a year from now, and we don't know whether that's true or not, then it's possible that we could not predict what you would be doing a year from now. But my, my point was not predictability. It was that you have no choice in what you're going to be doing a year from now or what you're going to be doing when you leave this room. That quantum mechanical and deterministic phenomena are not something that you have any control over. So that was that was the point I was trying to make. Okay, so um, how would you comment to the fact that I think that uh, uh, how one views I is the part of culture, yes. even in the sense of disciplines and in the sense of cultures. So when you say I and my brain, I think that you are deeply informed by dualism, which is social and natural, and I can do I being my brain and my social self, which is somehow limited by, by its consciousness and doesn't see what happens inside. So I am my brain and I am my body, and that is why I take care of my physical self when I want to, to uh, perform. So uh, how would you comment on that? Because if we do, do not have dualism, then uh, what is... What does I mean? Okay, let me repeat your question, which is a very good question. It's a very good question, but it doesn't, doesn't undermine my thesis, and I'll explain why. Um, and she's right, because what do I mean when I say I don't have free will? Is it my brain? Is it my body? Is it a combination of them? I mean, Dan Dennett would say that consciousness itself, or your sense of I-ness, is an illusion. It's an illusion that might have been an evolutionarily formed illusion, that the idea that there's some little person up in this head that is me is an illusion. And of course, this is an illusion like free will that all of us have. I feel it all the time. I'm Jerry Coyne, right? But I'm not really. I'm a collection of drawings and stuff. But so you're right. Um, I use I as a very loosely term there, but I would maintain that that does not say anything about whether or not our behaviors could have been otherwise. Whatever you call I, whether it be your brain and your body, the illusion that is materialistic illusion that we are little people steering our bodies through life, it doesn't matter because no matter what I is, what I does comes as a result of the laws of physics. So you don't get any free will by saying, I mean, sorry, you don't, yeah, you don't get free will by saying that I is an illusion, just like free will is an illusion. But you're right, and I just didn't want to get into your point because it's a whole lecture in itself about the illusion of consciousness and I. But again, that doesn't, the important point I want to make is that we do not have the ability to choose otherwise from what we did, and that's completely irrelevant to what we conceive, consider to be I. Can you explain more thoroughly why to uh, say that my free will is actually uh, <coughs> my free will is actually a set of physical laws and genetics, blah blah blah. Yes. So can you explain a lot more thoroughly what how do those physical laws why do they do that? Why do they say, okay I'll go left and I will go right? Good question. 
Well, you're asking me a very complicated question. It's a good question. How do the, and that's one of the questions I put up at the end. How exactly do our genes and our environment work together to make us do one thing versus another? And we don't understand that, but we know in certain cases we can influence things. We know that there are certain areas of the brain that we can stimulate that will make you do one thing rather than another, like go like that, for example. So there are certain elementary things. And we all know that certain people's behaviors can be predicted that if we give somebody too much alcohol, he tends to be a mean drunk, as we say in the United States. Some people get aggressive when they're drunk. Other people, they, get, they hug you and they tell you that they love you. Um, so there are certain absolutely predictable things that could happen. But how that works on the brain level, the answer to your question depends on a knowledge of neuroscience that's far more sophisticated than we predict now. So even though I cannot tell you how it happens, what I can tell you is that unless the brain is made of something other than physical material, then it must obey the laws of physics. And if it obeys the laws of physics, then what the output of the brain is, is absolutely determined in the same way that the laws of physics are determined, or quantum mechanically indeterminate, but still not any affected by any agency of your own, which is, after all is something like an immaterial soul. So that's, I mean, it's a good question, but I, you know, I can't, I can't answer it because we don't know enough. So. Okay, we got a question over there. Uh, yes. so, uh, my question was partly answered by one lady that asked it. Mm -hmm. It was about what you think by eye. And I wanted to say that this delay between our awareness of uh, the decision doesn't have to mean that uh, it is not our decision. If we are one with the brain, with the body, it's still our decision, but this delay is coming to our consciousness. Some part of our being makes this decision based on physical propositions. But we become aware of it later. And then it's still free, but here we have this delay. But what do you, when, let me interrupt you for a second. You say, so yes, yeah, she's asking a good question here. Um, there's this delay between when we, our brain makes a decision and when we're conscious of having making a decision. But he says that, yes, we're still us making the decision. Yeah, okay, so that's a very good question. And the answer is, well, the whole free will thing is that we make a decision because we're conscious of it. It's not made by our brains before we're conscious of it. And so that's one answer to your question. The other answer is, how do you know that what that brain has decided in advance is done by you and could have been otherwise? I mean, it seems, very, it seems even harder to think that what happens to your unconscious can be something that's conscious because the whole notion of free will and agency depends on you saying, I feel like I'm going to do this or I want to do this. But if it's done in your brain before you're even conscious of it, what does it mean to have free will? Could, could your brain have decided otherwise? I don't think so because your brain is still subject to the laws of physics. Yeah, but still you're going into dualism. And you are Sorry? You're going into dualism, but you're arguing against it. And I always say you and your brain, who is this me and my brain? There is only me. And I'm one with my brain. So my brain's decision is my decision. There is no dualism. Yeah, I mean, what you're espousing, I think, and what he said was that it's still his decision because it's in his brain, regardless of whether it's a conscious decision or not. And yeah, I mean, I think it is his decision. If I decide to pick up this glass, this is my decision. But what I'm, this is not a free decision. I'm thirsty. I just gave a long lecture. I was determined to pick up this glass and have some water. And I feel like I decided that, but it was decided beforehand. And I would cl claim that if you make a decision as unconscious, it becomes even less free for two reasons. First of all, because if free will means anything, it means that you decide something consciously. That I pick up this glass. Not that 10 seconds ago or 10 minutes ago, I was done that. I mean, you can. what kind of free will is that? And second of all, even if my brain decided that 10 minutes ago, it could not have decided otherwise. So all you're doing is pushing back the locus of behavior to the unconscious decision that your brain makes. But it is still a decision that could only have gone one way. That would be my response to your question. But it's a very good question. I mean, this delay thing is argued about by a lot of people, so. V loud, please. Uh, okay, uh, I asked the question, although I'm not sure because of the consciousness thing that uh, we can answer just now. Uh, anyways, how could this set of physical laws that we all uh, are acting according to that, according to our free will and to our uh, uh, how could this set of physical laws and why does, uh, that 
doesn't do that. It works on all people. It should be all called out at the same set of physical rights. Yeah, maybe you could. I didn't quite get all that. Maybe you could so tell the audience. Or We're all on the same set of physical rights. How does this affect the placebo? Placebo effect? Is it a question about the placebo effect? Or how we know that all people are on the same physical laws? Yeah, well, okay. So you're saying, <laughs> let me ask you if this is your question. So you're saying that placebos, which are drugs that don't have any drugs in them, work on some people and not others. And how does that relate to free will? And how, does that, uh, how do you explain the ability of some people to self-heal and the ability of others not to? What was that for example? Uh, well, that's just basically the, the genetic constitution and the environmental constitution of people. Whether or not somebody is susceptible to, to placebo effects is a psychological issue. It depends on how credulous they are, on how much trust they have in their doctor, and probably on a lot of other unconscious things as well. Like you say self-healing. Um, that's a difference in physiology between people. But I would say that all of those phenomena are dependent on the psychological and physiological constitution that differs from one individual to another because of their genes and their environment. And it's still determined. So you, we, not, we might not be able to predict, you know, whether or not somebody can self-heal or is subject to placebo effect. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't matter for my argument. All that matters is that whether or not you respond or not respond is based on the laws of physics. Um, you cannot escape the view that your brain is a piece of, of matter and that that matter, like a piece of dirt, has to obey the laws of physics or like my computer, it has to obey the laws of physics. Uh, my question is connected to the previous one regarding the relation between a conscious and the unconscious part of the brain. Uh, it happens now that we are speaking in English, we are talking in English, but we could talk in Croatian or in Italian, in Italian or Spanish or whatever other languages. How come that the unconscious brain understand all those languages? If it's not connected with the conscious brain. Well, oh, sorry, I didn't know you were done. You us a graphic in which the brain respond a couple of seconds that the matter five, six, seven, before we consciously understand what we are going to do, how we are going to answer. But those two brains are one brain. There, is, there are no two brains. Uh, the whole brain works simultaneously all the time. There are billions of actions going on and on and on and it's impossible just to cut out one and say, okay, this one is the decisive one. The whole brain, the whole part of the body uh, uh, is involved. So, you mentioned before a glass of water. A glass of water, uh, we have heard this, so because the body, the body is related to the brain, the brain is related to the body. So you cannot simply split things and say, uh, okay, the brain decided and then I decided, we decided, as if the brain were not part of us. Yeah, you've said this several times. We have a different person. Do you have a question? And one which is one. I don't Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So that was not a question. That was a lecture. But let me respond to it. Um, that, yes, the conscious and the unconscious are clearly connected because they're both parts of the brains. And sometimes we be, our actions are dictated by our unconscious, like when you drive home tonight. Many of you will just do it by rote because it's, you have a program in your brain about how to turn the wheel. Others of you, if you get lost, will make a decision. So, you know, the, the conscious brain and the unconscious brain are connected to one another. But first, I would say two things in response to that. First, free will is the notion that when we are conscious of making a decision, that's when the decision is made. Not that it's unconscious, okay? But, okay, I'll grant you, as the gentleman over there said, okay, maybe the decisions are made unconsciously, but that's still free will. And then in answer to that, I will give you the same answer I gave him, which is, so what? Our, wherever, our, our conscious and our unconscious, as you say, 
so clearly are part of the same physical materialistic nexus of neurons and they have to obey the laws of physics. So my point wasn't that, you know, that all th everything we do comes from the conscious or we think everything we do comes from the conscious. I freely admit that much of human behavior, as Freud realized, much of it bullshit, but a lot of it, right, comes from the unconscious motivations. That still does not attack the argument that what we have no choice in what we do, that whatever we do has to obey the laws of physics, whether it be decided by our unconscious processes or our conscious processes, which, as you say, are connected to one another. Well, yes, I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to ask a question that's maybe a bit different. Well, I kind of completely believe in everything that you have said. You do or you don't? I do, I do for some time already. Yeah, thank you. My problem, however, yes. what do we do with it? Uh, like, the question I've been asking myself ever since is, should we then abandon a system of society based on democracy? Because this is a system that is based on our belief that we are choosing, you know? Now, when we know that we are not choosing, what, how should we use this in order to create a society that is going to fit our knowledge? Yeah, that, did everybody hear that? That's a very good question. Did everybody hear it? How do, well, she, her question wasn't about the law. Although you're a lawyer, I hope that maybe, you know, some of the changes in the legal system you might be able to affect. But what about the, our political system? Why should we have a democracy if everybody's vote is determined by f forces they don't understand? And my response to that would be, yeah, your vote is determined when you go into the polling booth, but it, you can be influenced by other factors. And we have a brain that has evolved to be rational and to want to create a better life for ourselves. I mean, after all, almost everything we do is to make our own well-being increased because that's what evolution would do to our brain. So in terms of a political system, we would want a political system that makes the, well, this is my view. This is, now we're in philosophy, but my own view is that we would want a polit political system that creates the greatest well-being for the greatest number of people. And we can make that decision rationally. And you, I could influence you. I mean, look what happened to this country when it was under Soviet domination. You had another kind of government. It didn't work very well, I don't think. I mean, maybe some people feel otherwise. But it seems to me that the experiment of democracy has created a larger amount of well-being for its citizens than the experiment of, of uh, Marxism or totalitarianism. So this is largely an empirical question, and you don't even have to believe in free will to do that. Um, you can just say, well, here's a number of societies, which one creates the most well-being for its inhabitants? Maybe it's a society in which people vote and they think they had a choice, but they didn't. But I would still say that, you know, a democracy works because people are subject to rational persuasion, because they have evolved to be able to understand arguments and if they have some empathy, and our empathy has evolved as well, I think Igor would agree with me there, that um, we would want for our fellow citizens what we want for ourselves. And in that case, a democracy in which everybody gets a say in who runs the government is probably a better system than totalitarianism. It could, if it could be shown that having a dictator um, like North Korea would create more well-being than a democracy, then I would say, well, maybe we should think about that. But you know that that's not the way it works. So, so I'd say that the question could be answered empirically um, and it can be justified post facto by the fact that people can be persuaded to do things if they think that those things are in their best interest. And for many people, it's in their best interest to live in a democracy. So. Uh, thank you, Professor Clyde. Okay.